I'm Jim Burris, host of All Things Considered and senior producer on 90.1 WABE FM, and you are watching the Atlanta Press Club Loudermilk Young debate series. This is the primary election debate between Republican candidates in Congressional District 7. Now, in order to ensure that everyone is safe, candidates are participating from their homes. I am at the studios of Georgia Public Broadcasting. The Atlanta Press Club gives a special thanks to our broadcast partner here at GPB for helping to organize these video debates. This is new for all of us, so uh, apologies if it's not as polished as normal, but uh, you know, we, we're, we're rolling with the situation, so to speak. Let's meet the candidates. They are in alphabetical order. Lisa Noel Babbage. Mark Good Gonzalez. morning. Good morning. Lynn Homrick. Good morning. Zachary Kenmore. Good morning. And uh, Rich McCormick. Good morning. And Renee Unterman. Good morning. Eugene Yu. All right, so it's, uh, Eugene, we are not hearing you um, just there. So um, let me go back and tell you about the candidates now that we've, uh, we've tested their audio. And Kurt Yeomans um, is with me. He is going to be the guest moderator here and uh, we'll get through this together for sure. Um, Elisa Noel Babbage has worked in the DeKalb County school system for 15 years. She also founded Women in Action. That's a nonpartisan civic organization aimed at revitalizing urban communities. Mark Gonzalez is an entrepreneur who has helped grow various organizations, including a golf academy and nutritional company. He was also a real estate investor. Lynn Homrick is a former vice president for the Home Depot. She also started a nonprofit supporting young women and girls. Zachary Kenimore is a Georgia native who has worked in various industries, including his family's nursery and the Home Depot. And Rich McCormick is a former Marine Corps pilot and an emergency room doctor. Renee Unterman is the former mayor of Loganville, and she currently represents the, uh, the state Senate, District 45. Eugene Yu, who formerly served in the Army as a military policeman and later worked as a sheriff's deputy and firefighter. And Kurt Yeomans is a reporter with the Gwinnett Daily Post, and Kurt will help me today um, answer, or ask questions to the candidates. So let's get started. Please note, candidates will have 60 seconds to answer their questions and 30 seconds to respond to rebuttals. They will be muted when it's not their turn to speak, and they will be muted if they go over their allotted time. For the full set of rules, you can visit the Atlanta Press Club website. That's atlantapressclub.org. All right. To start the debate, each candidate will be asked one question. And Kurt, you get the first question to Eugene Yu. To write. Mr. Yu, uh, you on your website talk about uh, cutting some programs you see as redundant. Can you say what the first program you would recommend cutting would be? And we're not hearing you, Eugene. All right, uh, we'll come back to, uh, to Eugene Yu. I wanna ask a question now for Rich McCormick. And uh, that is given the pandemic that we are find ourselves in um, and, and the reason that we're coming to you via web chat today. How do you think the federal government has done in addressing the issue that we face? And if elected to Congress, how would you further um, uh, that response? Well, thank you for asking that question. And I think that President Trump has done an amazing job of decentralizing uh, the response to this. I think each state has a better command of what the problem is in their state. Words you want to uh, handle the, the pandemic as locally as possible. Uh, if you look at a, state, a country like Japan, who has the oldest per capita age group in the world and is closest to China, they had a very low incidence of disease, and that's because they handled this in clusters. The areas that need to be cordoned off, cordoned off. Everybody else got back to work as quickly as possible. We can do the same thing on a state level, and even inside of a state level. Uh, Fifteen seconds. Of disease, certain that have a low incidence of disease. So I think the less centralized we we uh, respond to this, the better. More uh, mobile we'll have. Furthermore, in in future 
uh, response in preparing for the next pandemic. All right. we, we, we've got to stop there. To bring home the things that are most strategically right. important to us. We're going to have to stop there. Thank you. Drugs or personal protective gear or anything else that's important because we don't know what the next pandemic is going to bring. Thank you. Uh, Kurt, please ask your question to Lynn Homrick. And Kurt, we're not hearing you either. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, Ms. Homerick, you know, on your website, you talk about uh, healthcare reform and the need for it. What specifically would you like to see as part of healthcare reform? Well, first of all, Kurt, uh, thank you so much. And Jim, thank you to you for hosting this. Um, I, I think the, the thing that I want to point out right now is that the Democrats are going to use this pandemic as an opportunity to push their agenda for socialized medicine. And if you think that socialized medicine works, just talk to some of the veterans that I've talked to on the campaign trail. It does not work. They're tired of waiting in line. They're tired of waiting on the phone for 30 minutes, and they're tired of waiting for three weeks to three months to see a doctor. So we definitely need to reform health care for our veterans. We also need to make sure that health care is affordable for all families. Right now, it's not. I don't believe in free health care for everyone, but I do want to see 15 seconds. Healthcare. I would start by driving down pharmaceutical drug prices. I would follow the president's lead. He's done some terrific work and uh, I would start there. Thank you. And it looks like we might have Eugene back on the um, back on the uh, WebEx. So Eugene, can you hear me? OK, we, we still can't hear you. So oh, you, they, they can hear me. Now I can. Now I can. Hello. You. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Mr. You. I think we're in business. Good. All right. Good. I'm definitely doing this live. So um, because of that, I want to go back to you. And Kurt, if you could ask your original question to Eugene Yu. And, and, and Kurt, we're not hearing you now. I can. I cannot hear you. Sorry. Sorry. I have myself muted. Sorry. Uh, so... Okay. <laughs> On your website, you talk about wanting to cut programs that you see as redundant uh, as an attempt to reduce the size of government. What's the first program you would cut? Well, we have, um, we all know we have a government have so much waste for spending about the social service, education, um, Planned Parenthood, all those kind of things. We, I want to cut. <clears throat> All right. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. That's the end of your answer. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. Um, Zachary Kennemore, my question for you is, um, in the last election for this seat, it was very close, the closest that it was in any U.S. seat race. Um, and the, the district has traditionally been heavily Republican, and now it's considered swing. How do you, if you do, appeal to a party and voters that may not be exactly aligned with you in order to win? Well, I believe that the main way that we achieve this is by winning more people over to our values rather than compromising them to okay. try to win over, to try, so in other words, instead of getting a big tent and letting everybody in, we need to try to bring more people in to our ideas rather than watering them down. So by going back to first principles, teaching about the Constitution, getting people to understand and like the document, I believe that that's going to go a lot further to actually getting good people into office than watering down our message and watering down our values. All right. And uh, Kurt, please ask your question to Lisa Noel Babbage. Hi, Ms. Babbage. So on your website, you talk about urban revitalization. That is a big issue in Gwinnett with areas such as Gwinnett Play Small. What would you see as the federal way to handle urban revitalization? Well, thank you, WABE. Thank you, the Atlanta Press Club and GPB. That's a great question, Kurt. Uh, urban revitalization along that I-85 corridor leading up to uh, Gwinnett Place Mall, as you said, is an opportunity district, and it's a zone where we, uh, as people of the seven district, need to focus our attention. I think it's important that the federal government give Georgia back not only its due share, 
but the taxpayer dollars that is owed to us from years of paying into a system that sends us elsewhere. I think the first thing we have to do is bring money back to Georgia and revitalize I-85 corridor. All right. And the next question to Mark Gonzalez, my question to you is, how do you think that the federal government has responded to this pandemic, especially the Trump administration? If you remember back, was vilified for stopping the flights from China. Then he was vilified for what we did in closing down international travel from Europe. The fact is, is he flattened the curve. The experts said that we could have 2.2 million deaths in this country. Right now, we're at 67,000. So I would have to say the data speaks for itself. Donald Trump has done a fantastic job. Now, we can't recover the lives that have been lost, but we certainly can make China know there was a cost to those lives. What, if elected, would you do to further what you just said to, to make that known? Well, it's a broader question of health care. Uh, I raised my hand for when Lynn answered. Here's the thing. We talk about health care, and we never talk about it in the most important terms. And that is, health care has become an opaque cartel in this country. It now controls over 20% of our gross domestic product. There is no transparency All right. in health All right, so we, we got to stop there. To All right, we'll thank you. We're going to have to stop there. And um, Kurt, you get the final question in this round to Renee Underman. Sure. Uh, Senator Underman, I want to ask about um, some, a flyer that I think you guys posted on your Facebook page this week about um, the WHO and defunding it. Um, what would you see is the, the area where the United States should uh, send money in terms of participating in, in international health issues? That's a very good question. And thank you, Kurt, for your service here in Gwinnett County. I appreciate it very much. I do agree with the president in the WHO. And if they would have done their job correctly in China, I don't believe we would have this global pandemic. I do think that we have to assist countries but we have to assist countries that are our best friends and not our enemies. And I believe that's exactly what China did. And unfortunately, we're seeing the economic consequences and the health consequences around the world. And, and President Trump made the right decision in defunding them. All right. And that concludes the first portion of the debate. Candidates will now ask a question to an opponent of their choice. Candidates will have 30 seconds to ask that question, 60 seconds for the response, and 30 seconds for a rebuttal. By random selection, Mark Gonzalez, you may ask the first question to an opponent of your choice. Yes, this question goes to Never Trumper Rich McCormick. Rich, we know that you didn't vote for uh, Donald Trump against Hillary, but the question I want to ask revolves around the money that you've taken from Envision Healthcare your campaign. Now, Envision is under federal investigation over surprise billing practices. I've been talking about surprise billing since day one of this election, and then you weighed in finally regarding your opposition. And the question, please? Yes. How do we feel comfortable that you are saying you want to stop surprise billing, yet you're taking money from the company that's behind surprise billing? So thanks for asking that. Mark, uh, you have a lot of misinformation in there. Matter of fact, almost everything you said was wrong. Uh, I'll start off by saying that I was involved in solving the healthcare problem of, of surprise billing well before I started into politics. I went down with the Medical Association of Georgia, the state capitol. Uh, we, we've been down there for three years in a row trying to fight special interests because the thing that you don't know because you're not in healthcare is that surprise billing hurts physicians as much as it hurts the patient. It hurts the physician-patient relationship. It hurts our income. It helps. It, it uh, helps nobody but the insurance companies. And, and quite frankly, it's insulting me because we actually spent a lot of time and effort going down to the state capital, and that's what got me. Involved Fifteen in seconds today, is solving the healthcare problem of surprise billing, which we finally did this year for the first time after three years of trying. And Mr. Gonzalez, if you'd like, you have thirty seconds for a response. Rich, I've given you countless times to be able to come clean regarding the fact that you work for Envision Healthcare Services. This is the company owned by KKR that's behind surprise billing. Surprise billing cost $40 billion last year to American consumers. How can we trust you? It's 15 kind of like seconds. saying 
that they want to stop sex trafficking. Come on now. All right, um, Lisa Noel Babbage, it's your turn to ask a question to one of your opponents. Thank you. My question is for Lynn. Lynn, you have said that you hate politics and you've thrown accusations on both sides of the aisle. With only over 55% of the seven district being minority, many of them first and second generation immigrants, how are you going to connect with those voters and work for them to represent them in Washington? Thank you, Lisa. Uh, one of the things that when we've been out on the campaign trail, I've talked to hundreds of voters myself and has talked to thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of voters. Number one at the top of their list is immigration. This is a very, very important issue for the seventh district. We have so many of our residents that have immigrated. So many of those residents are also looking forward to bringing their other family members over. I think that we have to, we Republicans have to take a strong stand on making sure that people get in line, that we enforce legislation that makes people get in line and follow the process that exists. This is very, very important. 15 seconds. We Republicans, we Republicans must stand together and let the seventh district know that as a party, as a nation, we are, we love our immigrants. All right, and you have the option for a 30 second response if you'd like. I think it's important that we do get in line, but getting someone to trust you is an important part of communicating that process. And I hope that that's something you will continue to work towards throughout this campaign. Thank All you. Right. And Zachary Kennemore, we come to you. It's your turn to ask a question of your opponent of choice. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'd like to ask something of uh, Ms. Babbage. So you've brought up multiple times the idea of bringing money back to the state for infrastructure, where in the Constitution does that exist? And I bring that up because one of the reasons our budget is so out of hand is because so 15 many seconds. individual representatives are trying to bring money back to their own states instead of actually balancing the budget. Thanks so much for that question. Now, I've never specifically stated that I would bring money back for infrastructure, but infrastructure is something that we need to focus on in this district. What I wanna do is balance our budget, period. And that's gonna automatically bring money back to Georgia. But there's many ways that we can work on infrastructure. And a lot of it has to do with broadening our economic base in the seventh district bringing companies and attracting businesses to Georgia the way uh, previous governors have done here. I wanna target Gwinnett County especially and some parts of South Forsyth for that infrastructure through business development. Great, thank you. Uh, Eugene Yu, it is your turn to ask a question of your opponent. Well, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is for the Mr. Kenamo. I have experienced it as a veterans and businessmen. What professional experience do you have that qualify you to be a congressman? Okay, thank you for that question, Mr. Yu. Um, I appreciate it. So basically, I don't really believe that we need experience in such sectors to be a representative because we are a representative government of the people. We're elected from the body of the people. I have 10 years of experience in the hotel industry, which is the um, hospitality industry. So I work with people in that sense, and I do appreciate uh, people like you and your service, and I thank you very much for that. And Mr. Yu, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal, if you'd like. Well, I mean, that, that, that's good enough. That's all. Okay, and I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Kenamore, I accidentally skipped your rebuttal um, for Ms. Babbage's comment. If you would like, uh, you, you, you can respond to that at this time. That's all right. I just want to make note that the Constitution doesn't actually allow us to just send money to states, and that's one of the reasons that our budget is out of control. We're passing these massive omnibus bills because different representatives are trying to bring money back to their state. I don't have the authority to do so. Lynn Homrick, please ask your question of your opponent of choice. Thank you, Jim. My question is for Mark Gonzalves. Mark, your message since day one of your campaign has been about our national debt. You've been sounding the alarm. I'm wondering if your views have changed on what we as a nation should do given the pandemic. We continue to add to our national debt 
And now our deficit has grown from over a million, a trillion dollars, excuse me, to almost four trillion during this pandemic. So we have to get through this, and then we've got to open up our country for our economy again. Our economy was never designed to be closed, but we've got to turn our economy back on in a safe, considered, thoughtful way, take care of the people that are vulnerable during this pandemic. But we've got to get our economy rolling again, or the consequences will be more devastating. All right, and uh, 30 seconds for a rebuttal, if you would like. Well, I, I, I thank you for that um, perspective, Mark, and I agree. I would just simply add um, that the next Congress is going to have to have some very, very important discussions about our national debt. Right now is not the time. We have to use the great fiscal power of the U.S. to get us through this, but we need people in Congress with business experience to help us sort through it once we get through the pandemic. Thank I you. Renee, Renee Unterman, it's uh, your turn to ask a question of the opponent of your choice. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Dr. McCormick why you refused to vote for President Trump against Hillary Clinton. Mr. McCormick. Well, that's the problem with politicians and would-be politicians. They think everything that they do is so important that the government is the answer to every solution. But uh, I'll tell you what I was doing in 2016. I spent over nine months of my life away from my family, most of it in Kandahar. Uh, and last eight of the nine, nine last nights I've, I've been in the ER. Uh, seeing patients who had COVID. The last 20 years of my life, I've spent serving them in this great nation's military. Over 20 years of service to the youth ministry. Uh, I, I'm really proud of who I am. I think if you put things in perspective, last night I saw a guy come in who had a heart attack at the age of 45 and died. I had to talk to his uh, mother, his daughter, and his sister and talk about them never seeing him again. I had a 40-year-old who came in with a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke at an intubator. And 15 seconds. And... and her life will never be the same. We are missing perspective. If you want to think that your 15 minutes at the ballot counts more than my nine months serving those people overseas, serving their great nation, I think I don't need to be armchair uh, lectured right. by those kind of people. All right, thank you. And um, Senator Unterman, your response. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. McCormick, I do appreciate your service, but I wanna be clear. Are you saying the reason you did not vote for President Trump against Hillary is because you were in Afghanistan at that time? I'll allow you to respond to that. Question? I'll allow you to respond to that. Go ahead, Mr. McCormick. Okay. Once again, uh, to put things in perspective, I wasn't the one who uh, said that Trump was my last choice and that uh, he was a, a, a TV star. All right, well, we will end with that. Although now it is uh, your turn, uh, Dr. McCormick, to ask a final question in this round of an opponent of your choice. Okay, I'll ask this to uh, Ms. Mr. Uh, Zach Kenimore, uh, kind of in regards to what we just heard, because there's a lot of mudslinging out there, a lot of misinformation. But if you were hearing somebody who was quoted by the, the newspaper that they thought that uh, President Trump was their last choice for president, that Brian Kemp should be investigated for criminal behavior, and they were considered to join the uh, Democrat Party, a pro And your question party, is? Because it was live with their beliefs. Do you think that would be the right person to represent you in Congress? Well, if I'm being honest, uh, probably not. Um, with that said, I want to just, because I'm completely honest, I'm going to lay it out there. I didn't actually vote for Trump. I voted for a third-party candidate under the Constitution Party, Daryl Castle. That's because I didn't know that the president would turn out to be as conservative as he is. I, we didn't know what his record was, but I'm going to vote for him in re-election. I did not vote for him originally. And with that note, I also didn't vote for Mitt Romney. I voted Constitution Party that year as well. Um, I voted Republican down ticket, but for the top, I voted for who I thought was the best candidate. All right, and you have a, an opportunity to rebut that, if you would like, Mr. McCormick. Sure would. So I think it's important to be genuine when we talk about who we voted for and who we didn't vote for, who we support, who we didn't support. And if we're going to wear a white jacket in an advertisement and pretend like we're seeing patients, that's called Stolten Valor, where I'm from. All right. Um, and, and we will come to you um, in just a moment, Senator Unterman, in the next round of, of questioning. That does conclude our second round for those just now joining us. This is the debate between Republican candidates for Congre Congressional District 7. 
Kurt Yeomans and I will now continue to question the candidates until we run out of time, and I will determine when a rebuttal is appropriate. Candidates may raise their hand if they feel that they are due a rebuttal. Uh, Kurt, you get the first question in this round. Great. Um, so this question actually goes to uh, everybody except uh, Mr. Gonzalez and, and Dr. McCormick because they've already answered this question. Um, but how would you assess um, how President Trump has handled the pandemic so far? And is there anything you would do differently? And if, if Mr. Gonzalez or Dr. McCormick want to answer that last part as well, they can as well. But we'll start with the others. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Ms. Babbage. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I know that the president has tried to make the best out of a bad situation across the board. He's done a lot of things attempting to close the border, even pre-pandemic, and making sure that governors do have a say in what happens in their respective states. However, of course, if we were in charge, there's always some things that we can tweak. Without having all of the information that the government has and in, 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 that the president has in his ear, it's hard for me to say specifically what I would have done, but I definitely would have looked at contact less uh, jobs to reopen first. And I also would have looked at on the first day of office, what our preparation was in advance. The best defense is a good offense. And if we were prepared for something along these lines in advance, we wouldn't have had as hard of a struggle coming up seconds. in place. So I, I congratulate him on what he did with the information he had. And uh, Mr. Yu? First of all, I want to tell you, I am so angry about a whole situation. The China, they are reckless performing this virus. I mean, put us, look at us. I mean, we have to do this kind of thing. Oh my God. However, your question is 15 seconds. Of course, I am uh, support of Donald Trump. We can overcome this obstacle. It's what we do as Americans. Some business need right. our support and they they should get it during this tough time. All right. We Thank will you. arrive again. All right. Thank you. And uh, Senator Unterman. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, I'm just like every other American that has been sitting in front of their TV and watching the president. And does he have a news conference? He has a news conference every single day. And not only when he has it, he has it for two and three hours. That transparency was desperately needed because Americans were begging for information. And I applaud him for doing that. The other thing I think he did was set up that task force with experts, with intellectuals guiding him. And I think he did an excellent job with that. But most importantly, the fake news. And he went after the fake news and he should be congratulated because I know what it's like battling them. Not only is it fake, but it's oftentimes 15 biased. seconds. And I appreciate the fact that he's paving the way for the rest of us. And that's one of the reasons that I want to go to Washington so that I can be standing up there right beside him and doing the exact same thing. Okay. And uh, Mr. Kennermore. Yes, thank you. Um, I believe that the president has done a pretty good job, and I love how he's been hitting the media and making them look even more foolish than they, than they already do. But the real thing is that we have civil liberties in this country, and a lot of the local states, state and local governments have been downright tyrannical during this pandemic. We have liberties they cannot infringe on. States and federal governments do not have rights. They only have powers but they don't have an unlimited license to just shut down the entire economic system. Commerce is important and they don't have the right to stop our freedom of assembly. They don't have the power to do that. 15 seconds. The Constitution. All right. And I just wanted to, to put it out there that these states and the localities have been downright tyrannical in this, not all of them, but some of them. And that right. therefore okay. should guard and defend our civil liberties. Thank you. And Ms. Hamrick. Thank you. Uh, the first thing I wanna say is I did vote for Donald Trump. I remember very vividly standing in the voting booth that day. For the first time I had hope that Washington could change 
because there was a business person running for U.S. president. He inspired me to run for Congress. I think he's done a terrific job of assembling a team led by Mike Pence, who has experience with public health issues and crises. He surrounded himself with some of the best medical experts. He was not afraid to take measures to stop travel to and from China and to and from Europe. He handles the press beautifully. I support his decisions. I can't wait to get to Washington to help him complete his agenda in rebuilding seconds. our economy. Rebuilding our economy is the next most important step. Nobody but Donald Trump as president will be able to do that. Thank you. All right. Was that everybody, Kurt? Uh, well, if there's anything um, Mr. Gonzalez or Dr. McCormick want to add on what anything they would do differently, uh, we can start with Dr. McCormick. We're not hearing you. I think I understand the healthcare necessities better than anybody else in this race. And I'm the only candidate that's been tweeted by Trump, not just once, but twice when it comes to supporting his policies. Okay. And Mr. Gonzalez? Well, Donald Trump uh, retweeted Mitt Romney as well, so I don't know what that means. Uh, Rich, I just want to circle back on this issue of Afghanistan. Are you saying that you were in Afghanistan during early voting, that three-week period, up until Election Day in November 2016? I'll be happy to address Mark online in the future. Thank you. Thank you. We um, ask that uh, we keep your responses to a response and not ask the candidates another question. I appreciate that. All right, so my question um, goes back to Lynn Helmrich, and, or Hamrick, excuse me, um, and that is, what if President Trump is not reelected? Are you prepared to work with uh, Democrats if elected? Well, absolutely. I think that it is important to reach across the aisle and work together. I come from the business world, Jim. Here's, what's, here's the biggest difference between the business world and Washington. In the business world, you work toward a set of greater goals. I look forward to getting to Washington and helping our party establish this set of greater goals that I see emerging. I mentioned earlier that I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of voters and my campaign has talked to thousands of voters. We are the party of the American worker, the American family, and the American dream. We will always reach across the aisle, but we will always stand up for our conservative values first. All right, thank you, Kurt. This question is for the entire panel. I'm just going to start at the corner. Um, we worked on the list as I see you guys showing up, but 287G has been obviously a big issue in Gwinnett County in the last year or two. And obviously you guys can't tell the, the sheriff's office what to do, and that's for the sheriff's race to sort out. But what would you do on the federal end to address uh, immigration policies such as 287G? And we'll start with Ms. Homrick. Uh, well, you, uh, thank you, Kurt. You referenced uh, 287G. The first thing I want to say about uh, 287G, I appreciate the law and order of this country. It is very, very important that we have that in place. 287G is a practice that we put in place. I believe we must support it. I want to take a step back, though, and talk about immigration. I mentioned earlier, this is at the top of the agenda for our voters in the 7th District. So much of the population in both Gwinnett and Forsyth County has immigrated here from another country. Their families have come and they're waiting for their families to get here. What is so important when it comes to immigration is that we must follow a process. We must first secure the border. We must second begin, seconds. To, begin to track people who are here on their visas. And third, we must put in place legislation that forces people to get in line and follow the process. All right. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Babbage. Thank you. I, I'm very proud of the fact that my father is an immigrant who legally resides in this country. And I know that deportation is on the forefront of the minds of people in the seventh. People shouldn't be afraid to drive if they have a driver's license. But 287G in the meantime has been a program that has helped our community stay safe. What we need to do on a federal level is not just rely on local uh, governments and districts to put a thumb on 
illegal immigration. We've got to fix our immigration process. And a lot of that is going to come from the federal level. I appreciate what Sheriff Conway has done to try to keep our citizens safe, but there's so many nuances to our immigration questions. We have plenty of people here who have been waiting online with visas and haven't been allowed to go through the process of legal immigration. And we've got more than 71,000 kids caught in the crossfire. So we've got to do something from the top down and meet in the middle. Okay, and uh, Mr. Yu? Yes, um, I support 287G. As you know, I am an immigrant. This is, issue is very important to me. The Republican Party is the real party for minority and immigrant. We have to enforce existing immigration law. Insulting to the illegal immigrant to allow illegal to stay here and have amnesty, come on. On your way here by doing it the, the right way. I am for legal immigration and allowing more legal immigrant in. So long as they go through the process, respect our immigration law seconds. and do it the right way. This is a sovereign nation. We have to protect our border, period. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. McCormick. I absolutely support the uh, 287G. Uh, and I, I'd go further on the national level. First thing we need to do is support the president and complete the wall. We need to stop the flow of illegal crime, uh, disease, drug trafficking, and, and child trafficking. And uh, most importantly, we need to end sanctuary cities, defund them so they can no longer be an encouragement to those people coming here for the wrong reason. Okay, and uh, Mr. Gonzalez? Yes, 287G is definitely near and dear to my heart. I'm the only one that's on this panel that actually attended the anti-287G rally earlier during this campaign. And believe me, there was an incredible amount of vitriol in that room. So I, from a federal level, I agree with my opponents. Number one is we must secure our borders and we must enforce our visa laws. In Georgia, we spent $2.5 billion in illegal immigration. We have more illegal immigrants than we have green card holders in the state of Georgia. This problem is costing us a fortune in changing our country right in front of our eyes. Okay, and uh, Senator Unterman. Thank you very much. I appreciate Mr. Gonzalez going to that meeting. And unfortunately, I had a previously scheduled meeting with the General Assembly. I'm the only candidate that has been with Sheriff Butch Conway with the 287G since its inception. I'm the only elected official that has supported him and he has endorsed my campaign. He has been a good friend for a long time and I'm very appreciative of that. There is one candidate in this race that is supported group that supports open borders. I can tell you I'm totally against that. We need to finish building the wall and helping Trump. We need to enforce existing laws and that is defunding whether it's on the federal, state or local level. We need to enforce uh, deportation and an issue that's very near and dear seconds. to my heart is sex trafficking. I have worked for a decade on child sex trafficking and if you look at the cartels that control uh, drugs and children being sex trafficked. That's what we need to go after. And that's why I've written all these laws all right. and put all the programs. And that's our time. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Kennermore. Yes. So 287G is good because it is the state or in this case, county level working with the federal government. A lot of these places in the country are sanctuary cities and they're actually breaking the law to try to protect illegal immigration. So we need more acts like 287G around the country and we need to crack down on these sanctuary cities. I would say we should defund the sanctuary cities, but really they should be defunded anyway because the federal government doesn't have the authority to give the money in the first place. The second thing is securing the border. We can all recognize the problem, but what are the solutions? In order to solve the problem, we have to stop radical judiciaries Judges that are making rulings, seconds. preventing the wall from being built, preventing immigration from being enforced. So we need to impeach those justices. 
and pass the new Judiciary Act under Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution. Thank you. Pardon me. I believe Tally that was all the candidates. Uh, did any candidate not get to answer? Thank you. Um, I want to go back to uh, Lisa Noel Babbage. Uh, previously, you said that um, you wanted to restore commerce to Georgia like previous governors have done. Uh, do you take issue with how Governor Kemp um, is attracting business in the state? Well, I, I two things. First of all, I can't criticize Governor Kemp for uh, maintaining what previous governors have done because it seems that he has been successful in doing so. However, I would like uh, Georgia to be diversified so it's not just the film industry that is getting tax breaks turned out to really not benefit Georgia citizens. We need to diversify other industries and that's where I would like to see our governor uh, take our economy. And, and I wanna follow up on that. You say that the film industry in Georgia has not benefited Georgia citizens? Well, there has been some uh, evidence to show that the tax breaks did not reach all communities and so that it was more so Hollywood that made a lot of money off of our tax breaks. Of course, people got jobs, but people who work in the film industry don't always have uh, health care. They're contract workers. And so the influx that we really wanted to see did not trickle down to all communities. So would you uh, repeal those tax incentives? Would you I, would start, I would certainly adjust them. I think that uh, it was, I believe, seven years that we were number one. Now we're, I believe, number three. As long as we're in the top 10, then we're going to get the benefit. But there's no reason for us to give away all of our tax incentives to one industry, especially not when it brought us a lot of hoopla from Hollywood we didn't want. Thank you. And I want to continue that question to Senator Unterman, uh, mm -hmm. being directly involved in this question. Do you believe that it is time to repeal uh, Georgia's tax credit for Hollywood and filmmakers here in the state? Well, there are a number of tax that have been implemented over the years, and because of the COVID-19, we are going to have to decrease the state budget by at least 14 percent, and absolutely everything is going to be on the table that we have to preserve and promote our essential services while the economy gets wrapped up. I'm very proud to have been a part of Governor Deal and also Governor Temp Kemp's administration as Georgia being the number one state in the nation to do business for the past six years. I envision us stepping back up to the plate just as we did when we stepped out of the recession in 2009 and 2010. Seconds. And we have a booming economy. Are the doors going to open up automatically? No, I envision them opening up gradually. But it's that experience of someone who has been through a recession that can go to Washington right. and bring a crippled economy back to the top. All right, and, and we'll stop there. And Kurt, I'll uh, hand it over to you to ask the next question. Sure, uh, this question is for Senator Unterman. Um, if you are the uh, nominee for the Republican Party for this seat, uh, it's expected the Democrats will um, go after you on your support of the heartbeat bill. What would you say in response to Democrats who would try to argue that you maybe not are not the, the candidate to represent women's issues since that is what they have framed the uh, heartbeat, heartbeat bill as an attack on. Well, first of all, let me say that the seventh congressional district is a Republican district. It's a misnomer that was stated at the beginning of this, that it's a trending blue district. President Trump won this district by seven points. Um, I envision taking over where John Linder legacy and Rob Woodall's legacy and that we're gonna to continue to win this district. As far as the heartbeat bill, you can better believe that every single time I'm gonna stand up for conservative values, I will never be a backbencher. I will stand up for the uh, value of life and especially children and taking care of vulnerable children like in sex trafficking. I wasn't a backbencher at the state capitol and I can guarantee you when I go to Washington, I won't be one either. And I'll be standing there with President Trump in, in the seventh district promoting these conservative values. All right. Um, and, and I will continue the question then. Um, and this is to Senator Unterman. In the last election, the margin of victory was two tenths of 1% out of hundreds of thousands of votes. Um, and, and so then why, why would you say that uh, you don't believe that uh, the district seven is a, a toss up, is a swing district? 
because Trump won this uh, district so over one. And I believe that uh, Representative Woodall, um, for everything that he did and the value that he's given to this district, he did not get out and campaign as aggressively. And that was one of the reasons actually that I was recruited because everyone knows that I'm the conservative fighter. And unfortunately he only won this district by 400 votes, but I can tell you the base is revved up and every one of these candidates knows it. And we're gonna get out and we're gonna trounce this district. And I look forward to unifying the GOP so that it will not be as close as it was. And Eugene Yu, I noticed that uh, you raised your hand. Would you like to, to uh, add to that? Well, I think that I'm totally disagree with uh, Senator, Senator Ottoman. Um, I think that Rob Woodall did a good, great job. And, but you have to understand this is our seven district becoming more and more diversity. Somebody put the frame to it that Republican party is a Caucasian party. Democratic Party is a minority party. Without this uneducated politically, those on that are a lot of minority newly immigrants, those people, they, they are all voting for the, the, the Democrat. So we have to really focus on to pick the right candidate who can beat seconds. the Democrat in the, this general election. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. McCormick, I have a health care question for you, and that is, do you believe that health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, has been beneficial to the, uh, to the U.S.? Not at all. Why not? As a matter of fact, uh, you've noticed since the Affordable Care Act has been instituted, prices have just gone up. Certainly, some people like to imply they think that doctors are the ones benefiting from this. Not at all. Our income has gone down. Patient care has suffered that tremendously, but it has the potential to even get worse as we run out of money because... The, the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry has, has profited in, in major ways. But healthcare itself, even though it's amazing healthcare, we have some of the best healthcare in the world. We have some of the best stroke and heart attack survival rates in the world. Our life expectancy is very, very high if you take out a homicide uh, higher than anybody else. But the problem is it's too expensive, and that goes down to special interest. We need less regulation, not more, to fix that. We need more free competition. We, we need 15 more seconds. Uh, transparency and we need more funded HSAs so that people can make the right decision. All right. And that is all the time we have for questions. Each candidate will now have 60 seconds for a closing statement. And Zachary Kennemore, you get the first closing statement today. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to, to be here and uh, to address everyone. So I want to just lay down that I have studied the Constitution for the past 10 years and probably know it better than any of my competitors. Okay. Not only do I know the Constitution, but I value it. I believe that that oath is a sacred oath and should not be violated. I believe in the right to life, that we are not upholding the Constitution with the preamble, which states that one of the reasons is to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and posterity. Posterity literally meaning those not yet born. The Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment both guarantee the right to life, and I propose passing an act that will secure that right. Likewise, I want to secure the right to bear arms by doing away with all of these restrictions that exist both federally and in the state and city local levels. Finally, I want to restrict the ju justices. Through Article Two or Article 3, Section 2, Paragraph 2, pass a new Judiciary Act that puts a limit on what the justices are able to rule on so that they cannot rule from all the right. bench. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Eugene Yu, please give your closing statement. You have 60 seconds. First of all, thank you all for watching and thank you for, to the GPB and Atlanta Press Club for the putting this debate on. Georgia 7th District is a very diverse. We as a Republican are always saying we are party of a minority and that we need to reach out to minority and become a more diverse party. Guess what? I'm the perfect candidate to represent Georgia 7th District and the Republican Party because I can also bring the minority vote. I'm the only candidate that can beat the Democrat in November. This race is crucial. We must not lose this seat to the Democrat. It's true, I was not born in America. 
I immigrated from the South Korea. I choose to come here. I choose to come to the land of freedom and liberty. I am passionate about serving my country and constituent. I've done that all, all my right. life. This all country right. has given me so thank much, and that. I want to always give back. All right, Mr. Yu, thank you for that. Your time is up. To my life to and serve my right. community. Thank Thanks. you. We now go to Lynn Homrick. It's your turn for a closing statement. Thank you, Jim. If you've heard me speak before, you know I hate politics, and that's exactly why I'm running. We need more non-politicians in Washington. Like the president, I am from the business world where things like results and accountability matter, and I think we can all agree that Washington could use more results and accountability. I want to go to Washington to help President Trump complete his agenda to me, it was so refreshing to have a president who's actually doing what he told us he was going to do. I want to bring my business experience to the people and to Washington to make sure that we rebuild our economy. I want to protect our Second Amendment rights and our unborn. <clears throat> I want to say one more thing. 15 seconds. This, is a race, this is a race between a career politician, a number of aspiring politicians, and a non-politician. I am your non-politician. I'm Lynn Homrick, and I ask for your vote on June 9th. Thank you. All right. Uh, Rich McCormick, please give your closing statement. The time to vote is almost here. You should be asking these questions. Who's the best candidate to keep this district red? Who's the best candidate to deliver a message that's in line with the president? And who genuinely believes what you believe? Which candidate doesn't just go to church but participates in their ministry, which can not only serves their country, but who actually has been away overseas in defense of their American dream, who's consistently run towards the battle, both here and abroad, without regards to profit or to safety, who lives here, prays here, works here, and who has shown that they're ready to help any time of the day when a need arises. I think we are defined not just by our words, but what we continually do. Not just by an instance, but by a lifetime of service. I'm Dr. Rich McCormick. I'm all in with you, the people, and our great president to bring back yeah. prosperity and protect America against socialism. All right, and in our closing statements, next we have Mark Gonzalez. It's your turn. I decided to run for Congress when the Democrats took back power in the House. I was horrified to learn about the Green New Deal and post-term abortion. During the course of this campaign, I have made clear that we must stand up to China, defend our Second Amendment, stop surprise health care billing, finish building the wall, stand with President Trump, enact term limits. We all know career politicians are destroying this country. Like President Trump, I'm the outsider in the race, the anti-establishment businessman who gets things done. I don't have the slickest ads or the most money, but I have the heart, the energy, and the will to get it done for we, the people. It comes down to a simple choice. Do you want a business person who has taken dollars from PACs and special interests, or do you want to have one of my po opponents who have? I'm Mark Gonsalves. I need your vote to stop the nonsense in Washington. Visit my website, markforgeorgia.com. God bless you. And Renee Unterman, your closing statement, please. Thank you so much. I am the only candidate in this race who has a proven record of fighting for conservative values. I delivered the largest income tax cut in Georgia history. I passed the strongest pro-life legislation in the country. And I may be the only person in this race who actually campaigned and voted for President Trump. I'm the proven conservative fighter who delivered on the conservative issues that matter to most of Georgia and I'm again in Washington, D.C. I thank you for your time. I ask you for your vote. For more information, you can go to ReneeUnterman.org. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. And Lisa Noel Babbage, you get the final closing statement today. Thank you, 7th District, and thank you, Georgia. I am the daughter of an immigrant, and I'm also a gun-owning constitutionalist. As an educator, I have to look at every Georgia family the same way. And that's something, unfortunately, that many folks who are running for this seat aren't able to do. 
I represent mothers, I represent workers, and I represent those who want to see the best and the brightest in America succeed. And the only way we can do that is not just from hearing from experts or relying on our own uh, professional experience. We have to have a heart connection with the voters. And we the people is who I work for. I wanna bring the breast and brightest to Washington, D.C. And I'm starting with my own name on the line. I'm looking for your vote on June 9th. My name is Lisa Noel Babbage. You can contact me at babbageforcongress.com. God bless you. All right, thank you to the candidates. And Kurt Yeomans, we have uh, just a moment here and I want to give you the opportunity to uh, say something, kind of a closing statement um, as you wish. Go ahead. Uh, and I would just to remind uh, voters um, that early voting is coming up and mid-May around, I think, believe, May 18th. Uh, election day is currently set for July or June 9th. And uh, just remind voters that it's coming up. All right. Kurt Yeomans, thank you. And that concludes our debate. We'd like to remind voters that election day is Tuesday, June the 9th. Early voting begins on May 18th. I thank the candidates for participating in this unusual debate today and give a special thank you to Kurt Yeomans for assisting me with the questions. I'd also like to thank the Atlanta Press Club and Georgia Public Broadcasting for arranging today's debate. For more information on the full schedule or the full schedule of the primary election debates, please visit atlantapressclub.org. This debate will be archived there and on Georgia Public Broadcasting's website at gpb.org. I'm Jim Burris. Thank you for joining us for the Atlanta Press Club's Louder Milk Young debate series. And wash your hands.